Hello, welcome to our Thursday night Bible study. Glad you all came out this evening. Uh, I do thank you for coming out, being honest. We wouldn't be Bible study without you guys. So I appreciate you. And uh, we are in, we're, we're going to look at Acts chapter 22. I'm going to back up to just the last few chapters in Acts chapter 21, just to get you caught back up from last week, because the chapters kind of ended in an odd spot. But today, um, Paul has finished his third missionary journey. Uh, I guess it officially ended when he made it back to Antioch, Assyria. He had since then went to Jerusalem knowing what was going to happen to him. Before he ever even left for Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit had told him two words, jail and suffering. And that's what he knew. Uh, he met a couple prophets on the way there. Um, one of them went so far as to walk over and take his belt off of him sat down on the floor and tied his hands and feet up with the belt and said, Holy Spirit, the Lord says this is what's going to happen to you when you get to Jerusalem. So um, he knew what was waiting for him when he gets to Jerusalem. We're going to start. We're going to see that start to transpose tonight in Acts chapter 22. However, the Holy Spirit never told him not to go. So it, it was. We, we even see a verse here, and I'll stop and remind you, the Holy Spirit is absolutely directing the, the, the paths of everybody here. But um, so, you know, that was one of the questions we had raised when we got to that point about the prophecies. Is he disobeying the Holy Spirit by going to Jerusalem with all these prophecies telling him that he's, he's heading for suffering? And the answer is no. God's in the suffering. There's a purpose for it. So... Uh, we'll, we'll start to come that to come bring that all together tonight. Um, when Paul got to Jerusalem, we did this last week. When he got to Jerusalem, he immediately went to the elders and, and the, uh, uh, the the apostles, the other apostles, to ask or to say hello. He, he basically gave a, a test a testified of what was going on with all the churches that he was starting, especially in the Gentile nations, and um, they it says says they praise the Lord. But then, as soon as the next breath, they say, we heard that you've been teaching people to disobey the law. What are we supposed to do about this? So at their advice, Paul went to the temple whenever there was seven men from Jerusalem uh, that was completing the uh, vow of the Nazarene. And they even asked Paul to pay for the, the part where he had to be that the seven men had to ceremonially have their heads shaved. And, and this is a, a big vow that's, that's in the old Testament back in the Torah. Uh, uh, this was just like we do for like fasting or, or other believers might do uh, like Lent, the 40 days of Lent. It's just a time separated to be the God that wasn't allowed to touch alcohol, wasn't allowed to touch anything to do with the grape, wasn't allowed to shave their head or cut their hair. That's why like Samson was a Nazarite for life. That's why he had the long hair. Uh, John the Baptist, Nazarite for life. But it, you could set a goal. You could say, I do it for 30 days, do it for six weeks two months, whatever you wanted to do. But anyways, they'd asked Paul to go to the temple with these men, and he did to show that he was not opposing the law. Well, it didn't work. Um, whenever he got there, and, and that's, that's what we're getting ready to Well, we ended with last week is, is when he was at the temple, there, a riot broke out over him. They wanted to kill him. And that's kind of where we left off is he's getting ready to step up and to address the the Gentile, I'm sorry, the Jewish uh, people in the temple. So I, I got a, I got a quiz before we get there. Paul does pretty good on this speech. Or it's, it's really a testimony. And I'll, I'll get into that when we get there. But um, he says he says one word. That makes everybody absolutely go into a rage, want to kill him. And I'm not going to tell you what the word is until we get there. <laughs> don't cheat and look ahead if you, if you don't know. <laughs> but, but in your mind, while we pray, try to guess. What would be one word that would make everybody so mad that they want to kill a human being? Right? So well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Man, it's beautiful. And, and 
My brothers and sisters have come out here tonight to try to draw closer to you. We do this by, by studying your word. We learn more about you. The more we learn about you, the, the more we fall in love with you. The more we fall in love with you, the deeper our relationship with you is. So, Father, that's why, that's why these good people come out here tonight, was to uh, fall deeper in love with you, to draw closer to you. They don't need to hear a word I have to say. What we all need is to hear from the Holy Spirit. So I ask you, it's, it's your promise in the word said that he would guide us and direct us. He would even show us the future. So I'm asking you for that uh, uh, promise out of the word is that you would send your Holy Spirit to speak to each and every one of us tonight using your word. This is for your glory. So we love you. We give you all the credit for everything good that's said here tonight. In Jesus name. Everybody said. All right, so I'm actually going to read the last few verses in uh, Acts chapter 21. I'm going to actually start in uh, 2137, just to get you to the point where Paul is getting ready to speak to the Jewish people. Uh, because, again, I just felt that the, the chapters really ended and started in a weird spot. So Acts chapter 30, or I'm sorry, Acts chapter 21, starting in verse 37. And it says, as Paul was about to be taken inside, he said to the commander. So the, uh, I'm, I'm trying to read this to get you caught up. But to get you caught up to this is he was in the temple. Everybody gets mad, tries to kill him. So the, these guys had to pick him up over, over their head to carry him out. So the uh, commander was a Roman commander. So it says the commander, he said to the commander, may I have a word with you? And it says, do you know Greek? So we can see but reading between the lines, Paul was speaking to the commander in Greek. The commander was surprised. Aren't you the Egyptian who led the, the rebellion uh, some time ago and took 4,000 members of the Assyrians out into the desert? In verse 39, Paul said, no, no, that wasn't me. He said, no, I'm a Jew, a citizen of Tarsus of Sicilia, which is an important city. Please let me talk to these people. The commander agreed. So Paul stood up on the stairs and motion for the people to be quiet. This is a deep silence enveloped the crowd, uh, the crowd and he addressed them in their own language, Aramaic. And, uh, you know, so, so it goes into the language part just to show you what's going on, but that's just a few verses to bring us up to speed. So let's jump into Acts chapter 22. I'm going to read verses one and two to begin with. So this is Paul speaking. He says, brothers, and esteemed fathers, Paul said, listen to me as I offer my defense. In verse 2, it says, when they heard him speaking in their own language, the silence was even greater. So, so um, Paul was, it spoke to the commander in Greek. Now he's back to speaking in Aramaic, which was the standard religion at the time. Yes, that's what Jesus spoke. He didn't, everybody, most Jews could read Hebrew, didn't speak Hebrew a whole lot. They spoke uh, Aramaic. So here we go. Verse three. It says, when Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in the city of Sicilia, uh, and I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamela. As a student, I was carefully trained in the Jewish laws and customs. I became zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. So there's a whole lot to unpack in that one verse. Uh, it begins with Paul being a Jew, so he's addressing the Jews. So he begins by making a connection, and we're going to see that connection. He, he's trying to uh, uh, let them see that he knows where they're coming from. And it's what he says. He says, I'm a Jew, but he was born in Tarsus, which is what we know today as being Turkey. So Turkey was, if you look at a map, it kind of really makes sense. When Rome, was Italy, came into the Middle East, they had to cross through Turkey to get there. They captured the men, you know, the, 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 Roman Empire took over Jerusalem in 70 AD. It was not Roman soldiers. They was Roman soldiers. They wasn't Roman people. They were Turkey people, Turkish. They was uh, Ishmaelites, the ones who destroyed the temple. But anyhow, um, so Turkey was part of the Roman Empire. 
So if you was born there in Tarsus, you was a Roman citizen. However, there was part, p- places like Israel that was um, not, they was under Roman control. But if you was born a Jew in, Jer- in Jerusalem, you was not a citizen. You was a Jew, but, but, but you was under their control. So there's a little bit of difference. Paul is talking to people who are not Romans, not Roman citizens, but they are Jews. So <clears throat> he, he's trying to still make his connection when he said, um, I was brought up and educated in Jerusalem under um, Gamaliel. Uh, he, he was the most popular rabbi at the time. He was the smartest man, and this is the second time we've seen him. And if you remember all the way back whenever the church was first starting right after Pentecost, that they brought Peter and John in to see the, uh, the, the high council, and there was an old guy that stood up, and he said, Hey, he said, look, if these guys are not of God, let's just ignore them. It'll go away. He says, but if it is a God, we can't stop it. That's the same guy. This is the guy that trained Paul. So... Whenever he used that and he's name dropping, whenever he said that, they went, oh, okay. So he's an educated guy. He was actually a Pharisee himself, right? And he said he he was trained under the Jewish law. And and the, the part of what Paul said that makes me kind of draw back a little bit is he said, I was zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like you today. So he's trying to make a connection with the people. But I wonder, are they really trying to honor God? They were just trying to kill Paul. So uh, uh, they violated a pretty important law. That I'm going to show you by the time we end tonight. I'm going to wait till the closer to the end, but it's in Deuteronomy. And they're violating it. They are not following the law. Of course, we know that says you should not commit murder. He, <laughs> Yeah, so I'll come back to that. But they are not following the law. Right. They're not trying to honor God, but but he's trying to, like, give him a benefit of doubt. He's trying to uh, he's trying to make his connection with him. Um, so we're, we're going to see this tonight, too. Paul's also establishing that he was born in as a Roman citizen that has a lot of benefits to go with it. Now, you can buy your Roman citizenship and you're like a, a second class Roman citizen. But Paul is saying he has certain rights. He's telling everybody right off the bat. Now, another thing that I kind of pick up on myself as, as we get to the end of this chapter is the commander that he was speaking into in Greek. He doesn't speak Aramaic or he wasn't in within earshot because he doesn't know Paul is a Roman citizen, even after Paul just saying that. So uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that this guy is standing there and all he hears is a bunch of language that he don't understand. So he don't know what's going on. He don't know why everybody's mad, which is probably why he's letting things go. He wants to find out what's going on, okay? So, verse 4. Nope, nope. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I, I did say that, but, you know, Paul ends this with, I'm trying to honor God and everything I do just like you. I, I, again, that kind of makes me cringe a little bit because of what they was, what they was doing. All right, verse 4 and 5. Just kind of put that in the back of your head. Verse four and five. It said, and, and here he goes. He's what are they doing? They're persecuting him, right? So he's kind of still build this connection. And I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify, and we're getting ready to see these guys in a minute, can testify that this is so. For I received letters from them to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the Christians from there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. So again, he's drawing a connection with these with his listeners. They're trying to punish him for not following the law. He says, man, I was I was zealous after the law. Right. So he's making this connection. And if you notice when Paul, wherever he goes, he makes a connection. If he goes to a Jewish synagogue, he makes a connection with the Jews. If he walks into Athens, Greece, you know, he makes a connection. He doesn't bring up the the Jewish laws. He makes a connection with them on their level. So he does this everywhere he goes. This is nothing new for him. I'm kind of pointing this out because this is kind of a, a template for us, right? So he's making a connection first. And now that he's done with that connection, now he's going to start telling 
how all this has changed his life. And this is where he goes. Verse, I'm going to read six through eight. He says, I was on the road approaching Damascus about noon. A very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So verse eight, very short, says, who are you, Lord? I asked. Now, I don't know about everybody's Bible, but mine. Who are you, Lord? Lord is in a lowercase L because he doesn't know who he is. Lord is just like a ruler, right? So, so, um, I, 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 I put, he, he's not, he, he doesn't go into any theology. He don't, he's, he doesn't start quoting the, the Torah or the prophets or anything like that. He's simply doing what? He's telling his story, his life story. This is, this is what happened to me. See, I was on my way to Damascus, big bright light, heard this voice. Nobody else could see it, what was going on. So he's just telling them, this is what happened to me. And this is called giving your testimony. So everyone here has a testimony. And nobody can give your testimony but you. So you... I'm, I'm saying this because I hear it. I, I'm not qualified. To, I don't know any scripture. I can't quote scripture. You don't have to. You got a story. It's called witnessing. You're, you, if you go to court, you witness something. You're a witness. You're when you're a witness of this. You just tell your story. You don't have to be a theologian to do that. Now, if they start asking questions, yeah, that's a good question. Let's find the answer to that. But, but you know, it's, it's telling your story, and that's what Paul is doing here. It's how he begins. He, he did the setup. This is our connection. Now he starts telling his story, right? So verses 9 and 10, and I'm, I'm using this as a, as a template for us, 9 and 10. It says, the people with me saw the light but didn't understand what the voice was speaking to me. And I asked, what should I do? Lord. Now, in my Bible, Lord is a capital L because he just said, uh, I'm sorry. And the voice replied, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. It said the people with me didn't see the light. I'm sorry. Um, saw the light, but didn't understand the voice speaking to me. And when he said, what what should I do, Lord? So he believed the voice was Jesus of Nazareth. Now he, he knew who the person was, right? He was persecuting people who was in the way. So he automatically went to, he, he believed what the voice was saying. And it said, and the Lord told me, get up and go to Damascus and there you'll be told everything you are to do. So if he goes back, if you go back to that experience <coughs> that Paul had in the book of Acts, You'll see, it tells him, uh, and we're going to show him all the things he must suffer for me. So this is part of going back all the way to then. So, um, so that's why I put. Did you notice that it, that the Lord went to a uh, uh, capital L, which is showing that now now it's the Lord, right? So so he's automatically putting him in a deity position. Not, not an angelic. He doesn't think that he's being visited by a, an angel. He thinks that there's deity, that God is speaking to him. It, left, it leaves no doubt in his mind who's speaking to him. So <clears throat> I put notice that Paul is saying that everything he's been doing so far is being directed by who? This voice, the Lord. Because he, he said, Lord, what should I do? And it said, and the Lord told me, get up and go to Damascus, and there you'll be told everything you are to do. So he's kind of putting himself into the position. He's lining himself up to what I'm doing right here was what I was being told back then. That's brought me to this spot. So who, who are you really fighting against, me or the will of God? So he's kind of painting these people in a, in a bad place. So verses 11 and 12. It says, I was blinded by an intense light and had to be led by hand to Damascus by my companions. A man named Ananias lived there. He was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law and regarded by all the Jews of Damascus. So he drawed a connection with the Jews that are his audience and Ananias. A godly man, deeply devoted 
to the law. So eh, there we go. He's, he's trying to insinuate, I'm not going against the law. This is a godly man deeply devoted to the law and regarded, highly regarded by all the Jews who lived in Damascus. I'm going to read 13 through 16. It says, he came and stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And that very moment I could see. Then he told me, the God of our ancestors, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and hear him speak. So Paul is again saying, who was it that spoke to me? Jesus of Nazareth is the righteous one. Verse 15. For you are his witness, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. So what's he doing right now? Telling everybody what he's seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. So, so again, he's lining himself up to, I heard this man, I heard this voice from heaven, bright light, knocked me down to the ground. Nobody around me could hear the voice or understand the voice. So they seen the light. And the voice said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. And then he said, God, then, then Ananias had said, God has chosen you to know his will and to hear from the righteous one. Did it say hear or see? And to see, huh, to see the righteous one. So, so Jesus, uh, Paul is putting Jesus into this spot. Lord, deity. Uh, speaking from heaven in the light, and he is the righteous one, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one. So he's really putting Jesus out there to these people, to these to these Jews. Now, I can't help myself because I, I've heard these verses taught wrong, <laughs> um, and, and you've got to read it really closely that, that they say, well, it says there that you've got to be baptized in order to be uh, right, in order to have your sins washed away. Is that what it says? I'll read it again. <laughs> Let me find it. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. That was a, there, there's a period there. That's an end of a sentence. Be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. So what, what was your sins washed away? calling on the name of the Lord. All right. All right. All right. So, okay. 17 point. There's a little bit of theology, but seven, I told you, I put all these things on the shelf. Baptism's one of them, all these things on the shelf. And as I'm reading scripture, I pay closely attention to what lines up with what I believe that's on the shelf. So if I see something that contradicts what's on the shelf, then I start having issues. All right. So in my head, Verse 17, I'm going to read 17 through 20. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, hurry, leave Jerusalem, for the people won't accept your testimony about me. Uh, yeah, here we go. I'll go ahead and do the argument. Remember, remember Moses, God told him to go and free my people, we, but, but I can't do that. So Paul's no different. Verse 19, but Lord, I argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And uh, yeah, verse 20, and I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed, I stood by and kept the coats they took off when they stoned him. So, so Paul's disagreement with Jesus here, right? Jesus is speaking to him. His disagreement wasn't that he didn't want to. I don't want to tell people about Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a fair, I'm afraid, I'm embarrassed. What he's saying is his disagreement was um, not in his testimony, but that people would be afraid of him. Everybody there knows what I used to do. So what he's saying is, these people won't listen to me because I got a bad past. Anybody ever heard that? <laughs> Can't do that. They, they don't know where I've been, what I've done. Well, these people know where he's been and what he's done. That's his, that's his protest. These people won't accept anything I got to say. I've done too much bad stuff. Um, but, you know, he, if you remember the, the Damascus story in the beginning when it was happening, it was Ananias too. I ain't going to go talk to that guy. 
well, everybody knows he's coming here to persecute the church. And it took the Holy Spirit speaking to him, said, no, you need to go to him. And he did. So, uh, yeah, we can't judge people on their past either. So are you ready for the word? The word that fly, makes everybody fly off the handle. <laughs> All right. So uh, verse 21. But the Lord said to me, and so, so it's red letters. Paul is quoting Jesus here, right? <clears throat> but the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. <laughs> it's, it, it, it says it in verse 22. It says the crowd listened until Paul said that word. Okay. Then they began to shout away with such a fellow. He isn't fit to live. He said one, he said the word Gentile. He's not fit to live. They yelled through their coats and tossed handfuls of dust into the air. Oh, woe is me. The world's falling apart because he said Gentiles. So, so look, it depends on who you are as a Jew. And we're going to get into this a little bit later, but but some of these Jews only followed the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. There's not much theology in the first five books to do with heaven, with hell, not a whole lot with angels. There is the angel of the Lord, but every time it mentions him in, the, in those first five books, I always think it's Jesus, the pre-incarnated Jesus, the one who wrestled Jacob, the, the, the angel that stood, the angel of fire that stood in the bush that was not consumed it wasn't the bush was on fire it's the bush wasn't consumed by the angel which i still all that is jesus i think the the <clears throat> pillar of fire by by night and the pillar of smoke at day all jesus anyways there's not much in the afterlife there's no talk about hell no talk about heaven none of that stuff in those first five books so there's a lot of jews who doesn't believe in that stuff <coughs> It doesn't come till later. There's no mention of a Messiah, not even close to a deity like we know as, as a Godhead, a Trinity. There's no mention of that until Daniel chapter 7. That's way deep into the, to the Old Testament. So a lot of these Jews don't even believe in any of that stuff. Um, but but um, what would... I, I don't know how to say this. What, what, how much hatred would be inside of you that they even mention a Gentile you want to kill? Them? Uh, don't use a Gentile, use anything, right? Uh, the, the enemy of the United States, since we're Americans, the enemy of the United States, the, the Muslim terrorist, the really bad guys, right? Did anybody want to kill me for saying that? I said the two words, Muslim terrorist, anybody want to kill me? So what, what is the hatred in them? Why would they not want to see them know who God was? That's what it really comes down to. They're selfish. They're God's people. They don't want them to know who God is. We want you to die in a godless state. So much that if anybody even tries to tell you about God, we're going to kill them. That's the kind of stuff that goes through my head. It's unbelievable to me that, that these people would become so enraged. <clears throat> I thought of this today as I was doing my, uh, you know, I, I try to get it done before today. So I spend today just kind of proofreading it and refreshing from the beginning. But, um, man, I hate to say this, but the Jews hated Gentiles more than Hitler hated Jews. That's something to think about, isn't it? So, so that's the word. That's the word that throw them all into a, a fit. And verse 24 don't make much sense to me either. Because here it goes. It says the commander... Remember, the Jews just went into a fit because he said that word. It says the commander brought Paul inside and ordered him to be lashed with whips to make him confess his crime. He wanted to find out why the crowd had become so furious. So that's why I said I, I don't think the commander could speak Aramaic. He has no idea what was being said. All he know is Paul just cheesed everybody off really quick. So does it make sense to you? Well, we'll beat him. <laughs> What? So that's how I put it. Does it make sense to you? Everyone is mad at this guy, so we're going to beat him to figure out why. 
but that's 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 his knee jerk reaction. Oh, let's just beat the guy. <laughs> right. So imagine though, I, I I almost look at this as Paul is sparing this commander. What if Paul would have said, These people hate you so bad that I just mentioned what you are, your your ethnicity. All I did was say the one word and they want to kill me. What do you think they'd do to you? So Paul's really kind of sparing this guy's feelings, ain't he? Because he don't know what's going on. He don't know that everybody hates him. <laughs> that bad. That bad. So, yeah, that's, that's how I put it. I put it, said, so, dude, the Jews hate you so much that they're going, at the mere mention of who you are, they're going to kill me. <laughs> so, again, makes no sense. Verse 25. Uh, so, so Paul's going to kind of uh, take a, a different a different uh, approach here. He said, when they tied Paul down to lash him, Paul said to the officer standing there, is it legal for you to whip a Roman soldier, a citizen who hasn't been tried? Well, the answer is no, it is not. It is not legal to do that. Remember I said that there's some benefits that come with being a Roman citizen. This is one of them. And, and to, to prove the, the, what I said earlier about if you was born in Israel, you was under Roman control, but you wasn't a Roman, a Roman citizen. If Jesus was a Roman citizen, they're not allowed to be crucified. It's too cruel of a death. So when Paul gets to, gets to Rome, which the book of Acts doesn't get us that far, but when uh, Paul gets to Rome, he is executed. He watches Peter to be executed. Peter was, actually, Peter watched his wife be crucified. And then when he went to crucify Peter, he said, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus, to die like my Lord. So they crucified him upside down. Paul witnessed all this. And then they took a sword and cut Paul's head off. The reason why? They couldn't crucify him because he was a Roman soldier or a citizen. So there's some benefits to being a Roman Roman citizen. A quick death is a very good benefit. You might not think so unless you're a guy suffering the slow death. So, um, so that's what he's saying is you're not allowed to do this. You're not. I, I, I am a Roman citizen. I have the right to be tried before I am punished. Twenty six through thirty, which will end the chapter. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I got plenty of time. Good. Here we go. 26. <clears throat> when the officer heard this, he went to the commander and asked, what are you doing? This man's a Roman citizen. So the commander went over and asked Paul, he says, tell me you are a Roman citizen. So he's like, are you lying to me, dude? Are, are you really a Roman citizen? And Paul said, yes, I certainly am. Paul replied, I am too. The commander muttered, and it cost me plenty. So remember I said you could buy your citizenship? Paul answered, but I am a citizen by birth. So it's, it's like a trump card. Everybody play euchre, right? He just played a trump card. I'm, I'm a citizen by birth. So <clears throat> the soldiers who was about to interrogate, so now we went from beating him, going to lash him, tying him down to interrogation. Uh, it says, the soldiers who were about to interrogate Paul quickly withdrawed when they had heard that he was a Roman citizen, and the commander was frightened because he had ordered him to be bound and whipped. So all these guys would be in trouble if they would have done this. The next day, the commander ordered the leading priests into session with the Jewish high council. He wanted to find out uh, what all the trouble was all about. He's still trying to figure out what's going on. So he released Paul to have him stand before them. So I would like to read. It won't take me very long. I'm almost done. But again, this really ends in an odd spot. And I thought verse 11 ended in a little better spot. So we're going to do chapter 23. Verses 1 through 11. It won't take me that long. So here I go. So Paul is standing before the high council at this, part, at this part. It says, gazing intently at the high council, Paul began. Now, remember, he always makes a connection with who he's with. Brothers, 
I have always lived before God with a clean conscience. So he's trying to, trying to do the same thing he'd done before. He's trying to do a setup. But verse 2, instantly Ananias, the high priest, commanded those close to Paul to slap him on, on the mouth. Didn't even want to hear him talk. So Paul said to him, God will slap you, you corrupt, corrupt, I'm sorry, you corrupt hypocrite. What kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me to be struck like that? We're going to explain what law he's breaking. Those standing near to Paul said to him, how dare you speak to God's high priest or insult God's high priest? And Paul doesn't recognize that he's the high priest. Verse 5, I'm sorry, brothers, I didn't realize that he was the high priest, Paul re replied. For the scriptures say you must not speak evil of any of your rulers. So, real quick, Paul didn't recognize Ananias as the high priest because he was breaking one of the Jewish laws that he is supposed to be upholding. And I'll show it to you. If you want to go with me, you can stay where you're at, and I'll read it out loud. It's one verse. I'm going to Deuteronomy 19.15, and I've already got it marked, but uh, if you want to see it, you can. Jesus spoke about this law quite often. If you read the, 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 the four Gospels, you will, you will hear some... People talk about this, about the witness of two or three. This, this, is the, the, this is the law. Deuteronomy 19, 15 says, You must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So we, we've heard that said through Jesus' life. Remember when Jesus said, I'm the son of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the son of man. They said, we can't believe you. That's only, the te that's only on one witness. And he says, no, there's three that bear witness in heaven, right? The, 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 the blood, the water, and the spirit it was the three. So, what, so Paul's position is, when, let's go back to the very first incident in, in chapter 22 whenever he was standing in the temple and they wanted to kill him because they had heard that he was telling people not to, not to uh, follow the law of Moses. Matter of fact, he's telling them to break it. Don't stop having your children circumcised. We don't need to do that no more, which is we're not recorded in the Bible anywhere. Right. But they wasn't following this, this law. Paul stands before the high priest. He is the top guy. Remember the, the guy on the day of atonement that they would tie a rope to his leg and they would let him walk into the Holy of Holies so that he could go into, you know, one day a year, the day of atonement. And the reason why the rope, because if he wasn't in the right place and he'd fall over dead, they would pull him back out. They couldn't go in to get him. He was this guy. Ananias was the guy who was going to go into the Holy of Holies. He's the high priest. And that's why Paul didn't recognize him. He's breaking the law. But, uh, a Jewish law by having him struck on the mouth when all he said is, I have always lived before God with a, with a clear conscience. Once him slapped. So that's why he doesn't recognize him. Um, I put on a side note, I wonder how that made Ananias feel deep down inside when he didn't recognize who he was. Because have you ever done something and somebody look at you? I get this at work and it's usually out of sarcasm, but it still makes me feel about that tall. You do something or say something. They go, oh, I thought she was a Christian or something along that line. Everybody hear something like that. It's usually somebody else trying to justify their own actions. But but see, so here's the high priest sitting there and Paul goes, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize that's who it was. Well, you, you know how these guys are dressed. And Paul said, I, don't, I didn't recognize who he was because he's breaking the law. That's basically what Paul's saying. And I know it was kind of underhanded, but um, yeah. Ananias is probably feeling like he failed. Because I know I feel like that when somebody makes that. Even if I know that they're saying it teasingly, uh, it still makes me feel, you know, I've only heard it a few times, but I have heard, oh, he ain't no better than I am. I'm like, no, I never said I was. But anyhow, but anyways, 
that that's that's probably what what I, Ananias was feeling at that moment. Also, um, he was failing. Verse six. See, I can't can't see the readings. God got me off. That's why they call me Squint. All right, here we go. Verse six. Paul realized that some of the members of the high council were were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. So he shouted. So. There's two different beliefs in the room, and I'll talk about those two in a second. Remember, I kind of told, I already spilt the beans on one of them, but there's two different theologies going on here with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he's going to say something that's going to split them down the middle because he's a Pharisee. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows ex he was a Pharisee. He knows exactly what they believe. Remember, he was well educated, and he knows exactly what the Sadducees believe. So this next sentence is to drive a wedge between the two. He says, brothers, I am a Pharisee, as were my ancestors, and I'm on trial because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> so what's going on here? Real quick. He's, he's purposely causing a division between the two. And, and, and I, I, I'm, I've got these in my notes for seven and eight, but I'll do it now. So the Sadducees, again, only believed in the first five books of, of the Old Testament, which is the Torah. Right. So they really did not believe in the afterlife of any type, especially a resurrection. What are you going to resurrect to? There's no afterlife. So there's no afterlife. There's no resurrection. They don't believe in angels and they 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 hold on to an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's the type of what they believe, because that's the Old Testament. Right. That's the old first five books. Now, the Pharisees, they were a little bit more. um Liberal, so to say, they, they read the, the, the prophets and which is, you know, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and even the minor prophets. They read those and they believed those and they, they followed those ways. So they believe in, in the afterlife. They believe in heaven and hell and all that. So Paul is not really I don't hate to say he's not telling the truth here, but I've never heard anybody say anything about resurrection up to this point. But he, but he's plainly trying to draw a division in between. Hey, I'm a Pharisee, like all my ancestors was, and I'm here because I believe in the resurrection. So this doesn't sit well with the rest of the crowd, as we'll see. Verse seven: This divided the council, the Pharisees against the Sadducees, for the Sadducee says there is no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the Pharisees believe in all of these. So there's a great uproar. Some of the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees jumped up and they began to uh, argue forcefully. We see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. Perhaps the spirit or an angel spoke to him. <laughs> so they don't even believe in angels or spirits. So, so anyways, that, that's, that's, the, um, that's the conflict. Paul did this on purpose. So <laughs> verse 10, it says, as the conflict grew more, Violence. I'll go back to this poor commander. He's just trying to figure out what's going on. He still don't know. Right? Right? He let Paul speak to the people so he could find out what's going on. All of a sudden, they blow up. They're listening intently. Then they're ripping their shirt like Hulk Hogan and throwing dirt in the air. They, you know, he, he drags them out of there. Going to beat him so he can figure out what's going on. So find out he's a Roman citizen. Well, that didn't work. We can't beat him. What do we do now? Put him in front of the high council. Boom, they start arguing. What, what does this guy say to everybody? <laughs> All right, so anyways, verse 10, it says, the conflict grew more violent. This is the, the, the holy people. <laughs> he's, he's made the holy people. It's like walking into a, a pastor's meeting and having everybody so mad they're yelling at each other. Right. So, as the conflict grew more violent, the commander was afraid they would tear Paul apart. So he ordered the soldiers to go and rescue him and forcefully take him back into the fortress. Whew. That night, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, here we go. This is the sentence that brings us all into everything that has happened is God orchestrated. It doesn't seem like it. You know, you think... Well, if God's in it, we're going to get through it, right? It's all going to be good. You know, if God tells me to do it. I know he's going to make everything come to good, come to good for, for what benefits, you know. So anyways, here we go. Uh, uh, so that night the Lord appeared to him. This is Jesus. 
Remember, he called him Lord. Jesus, be encouraged, Paul. Just if you have been my witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. So Jesus comes to him in a, in a, in a I don't know if it's a dream or a vision, whatever, it doesn't matter, but um, comes to him and, and explains to him that what you've been going through here in Jerusalem, it's going to happen to you in Rome. So who's behind it? told you when we first started the book of Acts, watch the Holy Spirit grow a church. He's orchestrating all of this. And yes, there's a lot and a lot of martyrs in Rome going to happen. Nero was an evil man. But because of what those men went through in Rome, we have what we have today. He's going to write a lot of books in the New Testament while he's in Rome. He stays in Rome under house arrest, so to say. It's just a term that we are more, more familiar with. But, yeah, he's, he's going to do a lot in Rome. So that's where he's headed to. Um, so, yeah, my, my notes, big, big letters with an exclamation mark. Um, God is behind us all. So next week, we're going to continue Paul's journey as he makes his way toward Rome. We're just going to take him a little while to get to Rome. There's a lot of bad stuff happens to him from here to there. But anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, everybody who's read the book of Acts, you know, there's a lot of crazy stuff getting ready to happen. But anyways, uh, we're going to continue with Paul's journey, and uh, we're going to continue with Paul's journey just as God has planned it. Right? So... Um, God has planned this all the beginning, all from the beginning. We're going to get to, uh, yeah, Paul's going to, to Rome where he can be a martyr. All God's plan. I know you think that I have this fetish to be. Uh, <laughs> it's not true, but it's just how I read the Bible. Pick up your cross and follow me. He never said it would be. He never promised that the cross. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's Paul's cross is heavy. And this is his path. So thank you for being here. I did really good on time. So thank you for being here. Uh, I do appreciate you guys coming. Look, I can study and do the best, the best Bible study in the whole world, which has a far, far reach. Uh, but if nobody shows up, it's not Bible study. So thank you guys for being here. I do, I do appreciate you. So. Hope you can come back. Hope it didn't bore you it's too bad. We come back to Acts chapter 23, verse 12. Father, we thank you for all the good things you spoke to us. Lord, that we can laugh through some of the most horrible moments in Paul's life. But, but we, we sit back and we look at it being ridiculous. The, the anger and the hatred. But Father, we know that you're behind this all. It's your will that is being completed here. And thank you for showing us, Lord, that uh, you know your your ways sometimes hard. It's the it's the you told us it was the narrow road, but you also told it it was the difficult road. So you're preparing us. I do believe. So I love you, Lord. I thank you for all. I thank you for your word. Thank you for my brothers and sisters who came out, Lord. I ask you that you bless them. Uh, keep them right under your wing, Lord, like a like a mama hen does her chicks. Father, just protect them. Uh, may we all keep the kingdom of God first in our life so you can take care of all the stuff. I know I say it all the time. The deeper I get in relationship with you, I'm, the more I see that the stuff is just that. It's just stuff. So we love you, Lord. And uh, again, bless my brothers and sisters. Be with our family. Protect them all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. See you all till next week. Yes. Not turning off. <laughs>